Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery here for the 200th time with another China History Podcast episode. 200 episodes, almost eight years. Seriously, thanks to everyone out there who collectively catapulted me to the ranks of the top 10 China History long-form podcasters on the World Wide Web. I never thought I would live to see that. My eternal gratitude to everyone who made that all possible. I didn't think I could stretch this topic out this long, but I've come to the realization that not only is this History of China-Vietnam Relations series going to five parts, it might even go to six. Am I long-winded or what? Believe me when I say I'm leaving out more than I'm leaving in. Everyone who is not familiar with Chinese or Vietnamese, the languages, I know all these names and whatnot are oppressive. I feel for you. When I listen to other history podcasts, Russia, India, Indonesia, Islam, Bulgarian, no matter. Those names and places the presenter is rattling off, hey, me too, babe. Goes in one ear and out the other. I don't sweat it, and no need for you to either. If I mention somebody you should know, I'll tell you. Okay, last episode, I left you all hanging precipitously on the eve of the first of three Mongol invasions of Vietnam. Let's uh, go through them quickly. To set the stage, let us uh, review. In 1257, as the Mongols were gearing up to expand their mighty empire a little to the south, the ruling emperor down in Tanglong, modern-day Hanoi, is Zhang Tai Dong. He was the child emperor we mentioned last time, who was plopped on the throne in 1225 by Zhan Tu Dou after he led the coup that overthrew the Li dynasty. Now, Zhan Tai Dong is a big boy, no longer a child, 39 years old, and he ends up being the first Viet ruler to face down the Mongol army. To zoom out and get a big picture glance at the Mongols, 1251, this is CHP episode 169, Monge Khan became the supreme ruler of the Mongol Empire. He was elected from amongst the grandsons of Genghis Khan. The great Khan's younger brother, Kublai's, his territory portfolio included China. This is Southern Song Dynasty time. After a relatively peaceful takeover of the north of China, Kublai Khan began a long, protracted battle to take the south of China. In 1253, he put the kingdom of Dali in his gun sights, and by 1256, they were finished off, and there was no further trouble down in Yunnan province, as far as the Mongols were concerned, and bordering Yunnan to the south, of course, Vietnam. At this time, there's no single great big unified China. The southern Song dynasty's lands only consisted of that part of the country from the Yangtze River south. The military commander picked... To snatch Vietnam was the son of Subutai. Mongol history enthusiasts all know Subutai. He was Genghis and Ogade Khan's main general, which makes him about the winningest general in world history. This son of Subutai, with 13 letters in his name that I won't burden you with, he took the fight to Dai Viet in 1258. Now, before the Mongols would go into a country and annihilate it, they would always generously offer up the opportunity for the attacky to submit first and save everyone the trouble and wholesale slaughter. That's how this all started. Dai Viet, the Mongols weren't all that familiar with that part of the world. Their primary interest in 1258 was to march down into Dai Viet lands, stage their army down there, and invade Song, China from the south. One Mongol army was already squeezing the Song from the north. Well, you're not going to believe this, but Zhang Tai Dong, the Dai Viet emperor, he refused the request. He knew once he let them in, they'd stay for good. Better to not let them in at all. And to exacerbate matters, the envoys sent by the Mongols to work out an arrangement, well, they were thrown in prison. So this breach in diplomatic protocol, disrespecting the Khan's diplomats so blatantly, well, that became the casus belli for the first... Mongol invasion of Vietnam in 1258. Now, the way some of the patriotic stories were written about past battles, I mean, this was one of those Lord of the Rings kinds of battles between local Viet forces fighting from atop war elephants against Mongol soldiers fighting totally out of their element. It all sounds epic, but 
Hey, the bigger the animal, the bigger the target. The Mongols would shoot the war elephants in the legs or feet or uh, attack their trunks with their swords, and a general panic of elephantine proportions ensued, and I could only imagine the spectacle. Well, it's almost eight centuries ago, so hard to say exactly what happened. Nationalist history will explain it one way, and others will say it happened in a different way. Who's to say? In this first encounter with the Mongols, the Viet forces got clobbered. The Mongols came in like they did everywhere else, and they were just too overwhelming in their force. In the end, Zhen Tai Tong and the whole royal court had to abandon the capital, Tang Laom, and make a hasty retreat. And as they fled the Red River Delta, they burned everything along the way, leaving nothing but destruction for the Mongols to march past, and they razed Tang Laom to the ground. If there was one thing the Viet people could always count on to wear down their northern opponents, it was their climate. The steppes of Mongolia couldn't have been more different than the jungles, rivers, swamps, mountains, and humid tropical climate of Vietnam. The Mongol troops suffered from the insects, diseases, and most of all, from the deadly effective guerrilla tactics of the local Viets who, well, as we've seen over the past few episodes of this series, already had racked up more than a thousand years of on-again, off-again practice trying to push the Chinese and other hostile forces from the west and south out of their lands. After fighting a losing battle with local Viet resistance and after death from disease decimated the Mongol army, they opted to declare victory and withdraw from Dai Viet and head back to China. They smashed the place up, but didn't achieve their primary objective of using Dai Viet as a staging area to invade China from the south. They still had years to go yet before they conquered Song, China. The following year, in 1259, Monke Khan, the ruler of the Mongol Empire, died. And all the killing and conquering got put on hold. China, Vietnam, everyone. They all got to enjoy one last respite before these grandsons of Genghis Khan worked out the succession crisis and came at them again. The succession did get worked out. And Kublai Khan, Ho Tat Lit in Vietnamese and Hu Pi Lieh in Mandarin, he ended up on top and ruled both the Mongol Empire as well as the Yuan Dynasty in China. It took him ten years, but the Song Dynasty fell to the Khan's armies. A century and a half before it had been the Jurchens who had punched out the Northern Song, and now the Mongols were finishing off the Southern Song. The Yuan Dynasty was established in 1271, but the last remnants of Song Dynasty resistance weren't eradicated until 1279. A good many Southern Song officials, scholars, and military leaders skedaddled down to Dai Viet to get out of harm's way. And later on, some of these Song military officers will aid the forces of Dai Viet when Kublai Khan comes knocking on their door again. The great Khan made his first attempt to invade Japan in 1274. We know from previous CHP episodes that didn't go too well. Before he went back for a second and third try at taking the land of the rising sun, he made some moves into Southeast Asia. We're only going to talk about Vietnam, but at the same time, as the second invasion of Vietnam, the Yuan also had boots on the ground in present-day northern Myanmar and in Indonesia on the island of Java. Ever since the Mongols left Dai Viet in 1259, Emperor Tran Tai Tong wisely opted to choose the path of least resistance and to send tribute to the great Khan and play along with the whole vassal state game. The Jun Dynasty sent tribute, as expected, and did enough diplomatically to keep the pot from boiling over. But despite repeated demands made by the court of Kublai Khan for Dai Viet to act like a proper tributary state, Jun Tai Tong repeatedly refused to go all the way as far as his personal bowing and scraping in front of the Khan, and no recognition was offered to the Dai Viet Jun Emperor. The Mongol court refused to treat him like a king or anything. As far as they were concerned, Dai Viet was a vassal state of the Mongol Yuan dynasty, masquerading around as an independent entity. And the fact that the Jun emperor would only go halfway as far as submitting to the Khan, well, that caused 
quite a bit of outrage. And guess who else was thumbing their nose at the great Yuan Empire? Champa, too. Remember, they were located just south of Dai Viet. They were playing the same game as the Viets up in the Red River Plain, submitting, but not in a wholly enthusiastic or sincere manner that the Mongols demanded. There was no wiggle room as far as how far down you had to bow to the Khan. So plans were made to show Champa the correct way. The Khan sent a group of envoys to the Dai Viet capital at Tanglaum and demanded safe passage for his armies through Dai Viet lands so that he could march down and destroy Champa. The Zhuan dynasty by this time was on its third emperor, Zhuan Yan Tong, grandson of the Zhuan dynasty founder, Zhuan Tai Tom. Zhuan Yan Tong was on duty in the capital when the Mongol army came calling this second time around. Usually all he had to do to earn the wrath of Khan was to refuse to pay proper tribute. When the Khan's envoys arrived in the capital to hammer out a deal with the Zhuan royal court, they were arrested and thrown in the slammer. The great Khan obviously did not like that kind of disrespect meted out and thereby called his generals together to come up with a plan on how to deal with these recalcitrant Vietnamese who refused to bend the knee in the direction of the great Khan and exhibit the kind of trembling respect that everyone else west of China was showing. For these diplomatic insults, plans for the second invasion of Dai Viet were put in place, and towards the end of 1284 the Mongol army began marching south. By 1284, the Song Dynasty had already been completely done away with. There were no more major distractions this time to divert the Mongols' attention. The battle plans called for knocking off Champa first in the south and central part of present-day Vietnam, and then looping back to the north to deal with the Jun ruler and his dynasty in Dai Viet. Fortunately, the Jun royal court down in the Dai Viet capital had plenty of advance warning that the invasion was coming, and they had ample time to plan for a defense. December 1284, it all started. By land and by sea, the Mongol forces invaded. Like last time, the Viet armies had to beat a hasty retreat in the face of such overwhelming force. Some Jun royals immediately defected, knowing the resistance was futile. The Mongols came with... Over half a million troops this time. No screwing around. It's like what the USA had in Vietnam in 1969. Over the next several months, though, after the capital, Tang Lom, had been sacked for a second time, the shock and awe of the initial invasion turned into another hard slog of a battle with heroic performances turned in by Viet generals leading around a couple hundred thousand troops. By the following year, in April 1285... Again, with the dependable assistance of the Vietnam climate and guerrilla fighters operating out of the hills, the tide had turned in favor of the Dai Viet. Even the Champa armies were deadly in their resistance against the Mongols. Like last time, this operation went well at first for the Mongol forces, but then, not so well. No matter by land or by sea, the generals of the Yuan dynasty could not meet with the same success in Dai Viet that they had enjoyed everywhere else in the world. Once again, after inflicting a lot of pain and civil destruction, the Mongol army sailed back north to China, knowing they had been defeated. I didn't mention him in the last episode, but I will now. The man of the hour to lead the fight against the Mongol invasions was a prince from the ruling house, Jun Hung Dao. This is another name in Vietnam history that gets top, top billing. He helped lead the fight against the Mongols all three times, and in the second and third invasions at least, played the key role in the defense and ultimate victory over the Mongols. A couple years later, after regrouping, in March 1287, Kublai Khan, anxious to avenge the last military debacle, called for a third invasion. And the army this time was commanded by the great Khan's own son, Prince Togan, a Mongol dream team of generals and military might was assembled to take down Dai Viet once and for all. The navy that Kublai Khan was intending to use to defeat Japan was diverted southward instead. I hate to bore you with the same old plot line, but the Mongols rolled into Dai Viet from the north and from the south and pretty much 
trashed the place once again in that little way they were famous for, Tang Laum, the capital, today's Hanoi, again was going to have to start all over to rebuild from the ground up. The royal court had fled, with Chan Hung Dao leading the retreat, and he rallied his generals, and what followed was one of those come-back-of-the-century situations. There's this heroic speech that he gives to his generals and officers on the eve of the Mongol invasion that's right up there with Li Tung-Git's poem about Nan Guo Shan He, Nam Guk Sun Ha. This speech, supposedly uttered by the great Vietnamese hero Chun Hung Dao, well... It's not the same as the Gettysburg Address, but as far as its importance in the national conscience, not to mention with the propaganda department, it's quite a profound document from Vietnam history, with strong words that say, how dare these barbarians invade our land. Let me interject something here. No one knows who said this first, but aside from what Ben Franklin wrote about death and taxes, one thing that's certain is that history is always written by the victors. You can't say that in today's ultra-documented world, but as far as what happened in these ancient and olden times, all this history is open to interpretation and, you know, unfortunately, exploitation. I just want everyone to keep in mind that this series isn't meant to be the end-all authoritative source for general Vietnamese history as it pertained to China. I'm telling a lot of the story through the lives of these national heroes, like Zhen Hung Dao, for example. All these amazing examples of his speech, his leadership ability, glorious achievements, and all that he supposedly did to repel the Mongol invasions and ultimately defeat them. Well, we don't know the details any more than we know whether Li Tung Git wrote that patriotic poem, Nam Guk Sun Ha, that's called Vietnam's First Declaration of Independence. In fact, historians today will say he never wrote that at all, and that a lot of these epic battles and feats of heroism written about in these surviving documents were, well, long on nationalism and short on actual facts. Anyway, moving on, what pretty much put an end to this last and final invasion from the Yuan Dynasty was the epic Third Battle of the Bakdang River of 1288. This was the third time... The fate of Vietnam was decided at this river, the Song Bak Dang, the Bai Tang Jiang, Zhen Hung Dao. He recalled what Ngo Quyn had done 350 years ago in 938, when he had the Chinese army of the southern Han bearing down on him. Zhen Hung Dao knew if Ngo Quyn's strategy of sabotaging the river worked before, yeah, it would work again. Zhen Hong Dao copied Ngo Quyn's technique in designing these iron-tipped pikes that were driven deep into the river's sand bed, sharp points facing out at an angle, and after once again luring the Mongols to a spot far enough upriver, and after the tide had gone from high to low, the Mongol Yuan Navy became aware that they had sailed right into a trap. Their formidable armada of 400 vessels. Now, they couldn't maneuver at low tide or defend themselves, and they were ambushed and soundly defeated right there on the Bakdang River. Kublai Khan's son, Togan, barely escaped with his life, although he would later feel the burn after returning to China when his father banished him for this disgraceful loss. In Vietnam history... This is one of the greatest milestone events of all time. And the Jun Dynasty, though respected for their other achievements as well, is mostly remembered for facing down the Mongol Yuan Dynasty military three times. The inspiration this provided the Vietnamese people over the next 700 years will be profound. The Dai Viet court did most of the necessary things to give the Yuan emperor the requisite face, but when it came to the Jun ruler personally coming to bow before the Yuan emperor, they could never get him to do that. Well, finally, in the end, after Kublai Khan passed from the scene in 1294, the Yuan dynasty stopped taking this so personally and ended up accepting the status quo, and no further demands were made by the Yuan emperors for Dai Viet to offer the full-blown tribute. Although it's not called Vietnam yet, the nation starts to come into its own here and out of China's formidable shadow. 
the Viet people had existed all this time, at least going back to Chao Tuo, as part of this, this sinosphere. I haven't emphasized this enough, but a lot of Chinese culture and influence had flooded into Vietnam by this time. A lot of it may have been adapted to suit Viet sensibilities, but make no mistake about it. China's cultural presence was most palpable from the Confucianist frame of mind that was ingrained by this time to many of the local customs. Not so much in other parts of Southeast Asia, but most definitely in northern Vietnam. And you could see China's presence everywhere, even when they weren't there. I think I mentioned in part one, the Sima Qian of Vietnam was a man named Lei Van Hu, Li Wenxiu in Mandarin. He was the court historian tasked with writing the definitive official history of the country. It was called the Da Yue Shi Ji. This work was Vietnam's version of China's record of the grand historian, and it chronicled the history of Dai Viet, going all the way back to the times of the founding of Nan Yue by Zhao Tuo. Regrettably, this work did not survive into modern times, but there sure was a lot written about it and quoted from it. Up to that point in the Jun Dynasty, everything written about the history of Vietnam had been written by Chinese sources in classical Chinese. So this was the first time these histories were rewritten with Vietnamese sensibilities and accounts written into the record. Lei Van Hu also referred to Zhao Tuo as the one who inaugurated the imperial institution in our country and compared him to sacred cows in China, such as Shun and Zhou Wenwang, quote, for sealing off the frontier, establishing the country's army, following the correct way in relations with neighboring countries, and safeguarding the throne, end quote. Of the Zhong sisters, the Haiba Zhong of the Han Dynasty, interestingly, he noted their achievements, not so much for what these two women did, but as an example of what a man should have done. Lei Van Hu had written, quote, Zheng Zhak and Zheng Ni were women, but they had only to make one single appeal. Then the whole provinces, together with 65 counties, all responded. Setting up the country and conducting a monarchy were so easy for them. But men were merely kowtowing and resigning to submit to the Chinese. They would not even know that they should be embarrassed by the two Zheng ladies. How shameful, end quote. Modern understanding of the Jung sisters has peeled away the popular nationalist version that says they were all about expelling China from Vietnam. The consensus among modern Vietnam scholars is that the sisters' story was really one involving regional conflicts more than anything. This first history of Vietnam, this Vietnamese version of the Shi Ji, named all the heroes and villains from Vietnam history. It was written in the style of the Comprehensive Mirror to Aid in Government, the Zizhi Tong Jian, and it gave the most detailed account of the Mongol invasions to date. The Zizhi Tong Jian was itself, I guess you could call it, an updated records of the Grand Historian. It covered the history of China from the Warring States period to the Northern Song, the, the period in which it was written. It didn't end there. More official histories were written by later Vietnamese historiographers. Lei Van Hu began his history with Zhao Tuo. Others went even further back, starting with King An Yung and the Lac Viet, who we discussed in episode one. Some of the Vietnamese ancient myths and legends, like China had with the San Huang Wu Di, the three sovereigns and five emperors, were also inserted into these later histories of Vietnam. As we all know, the Yuan Dynasty still had some life left in them after the death of Kublai Khan in 1294. Events went on for the Yuan, but the final few decades didn't go too well, and they were clearly on the way out by the looks of things. In 1351, the Red Turbans started their uprising, which exploded into a full-blown rebellion, the Hongjin Qi. One of these rebels fighting for the Red Turbans against the Mongols was Zhu Yuanzhang. He fought the Yuan forces for over a decade, from 1356 to 1367, and led the final assault that pushed the Mongols out of China after capturing their capital at Datu, a.k.a. Kanbalik, also known as the present-day city of Beijing. And that was the next big milestone in China-Vietnam relations. 1368, Zhu Yuanzhang 
founded the Ming Dynasty down in Nanjing, and like a few previous emperors, once he gets his house in order, he's going to start making the age-old demands China's emperors have been making since the Han Dynasty regarding proper tribute status and the basic political nature of the China-Viet relationship. Before we get to the upshot of Vietnam's refusal to give in to the demands made by the Ming Dynasty court. Let's quickly look at what happened in Vietnam after the Mongols went home for the third time. Let me just say that as glorious as the Jun Dynasty was, defeating, or shall I say, surviving the Mongols three times, they succumbed to the same fate as all the past great dynasties of China and Vietnam. What brought them to a conclusion was a combination of a bad emperor here and there, political infighting, and someone with ambition in a position to seize power. It all began with a cousin to one of the Jun princes named Ho Kui Li. Like the Juns, the Hos had originally come from China, from the Zhejiang area, and had migrated south uh, to the Red River Delta region. The Ho family began their power grab after the bane of all dynasties, a weak emperor on the throne, allowed an opening for the Hos to seize power from the Juns. Two years after the founding of the Ming, Ho Kui Li had staged a coup in 1370 with the help of Buddhist factions in the government and with Champa in the south. And by 1387, he was the most powerful political figure at the imperial court and made himself imperial regent in 1390. Five years later, he was comparing himself to the Duke of Zhou and China's revered Emperor Shun. In the end... During the easy-to-remember year of 1400, Ho Kui Li did away with the last Jun emperor, conveniently three years old and not in much of a position to fight back. Ho Kui Li set himself up as emperor and changed the name of the country from Dai Viet to Dai Ngu Guk. This was only a seven-year dynasty, but they left quite an impact with a number of reforms introduced during his reign. Ho Kui Li is also credited with making a deal with the king of Champa to give up parts of that kingdom to Daingu. Ho Kui Li had first gone after Champa in 1396 and followed that up with four separate waves of attacks between 1400 and 1403. So right here, for the first time, this Viet civilization, born along the Red River, centered around the city of Hanoi, now they were spreading out. With this expansion into the northern half of Champa, in came these Dai Viet people to homestead their way south, bringing that 15th century version of vietnamese to a region that, for the most part, was Hindu and more Indian than anything else. That's how it was done back then, before everything could be solidified into hard national borders. You conquered, you went in, and populated the place, diluted the local population... You own it from that point on. The Ho Dynasty also tried their utmost to patch things up with Ming China. However, the defeated Juns had beaten the Hoes to the punch and had already run to the Yongle Emperor at the Ming court, offering total and complete submission with no strings attached in return for some help in getting rid of these Ho Dynasty usurpers. The Ming... Yongle Emperor saw a political advantage to backing the ousted Juns. He demanded Ho Kui Li allow the deposed Jun ruler back on the throne and to allow his dynasty to be restored. The diplomatic process followed a well-worn script of the usual Viet resistance. All that was needed to make things worse was some incident. And that is what ended up happening. The Yongle Emperor had his excuse to invade when Daingu forces attacked a Ming convoy, bringing the Chun ruler back to Vietnam to be restored. Remember we had the Sui Li War, the former Li, that is. Then there was the Song Li War, that was the later Li that time. And now in the early Ming dynasty came the Ming Ho War. Incidentally, this was all happening right around the same time when Admiral Zheng He was getting ready to take his first voyage. So the Yongle Emperor yeah, had a lot on his plate. Late 1406, the invasion of Daingu is planned and gets underway. The battle plan called for one Ming army to invade from the west through Yunnan and another from the north in uh, Guangxi. By early 1407, the Ming armies had blown right in and taken control of the whole Red River Delta region. 
Live by the sword, die by the sword. Ho Kui Li, who had murdered his way to the throne, had to hit the road in May 1407, as the Ming forces made him public enemy number one. They pursued him and members of his Ho royal family and caught up with them the following month in June. Everyone was captured and taken back to China and were either killed or given some sort of unpleasant ending, reserved for vanquished royals. No one knows for sure what ultimately became of Ho Kui Li, but he certainly left his mark in his short dynasty, even though his dynasty's area of political control never went beyond the core Red River Delta region. After overthrowing the ruling dynasty down in Vietnam, China got to enjoy a fourth and final stretch as the ones in charge down in the former Daingu. The name was changed back to the old Chinese term for this region, Jiaozhi, or Yaoji. This period of domination during the Ming Dynasty lasted for 27 years. One of the more notable achievements of the Ming domination of Vietnam was the infusion of a great amount of Neo-Confucianism. For some reason, this brand of Ru philosophy was particularly embraced by the Vietnamese, as well as others whose worlds most closely orbited the Middle Kingdom. And just like we have Confucius Institutes today, back then the Ming government had funded 126 Confucian schools in Vietnam that were churning out these scholars and future officials. Wang Yangming, who we looked at uh, in the last couple episodes of that Chinese philosophy series, he hadn't come on the scene yet. But this Neo-Confucianism, this Song Xue, it first emerged during the Northern Song and stressed a strict hierarchy that placed the family over the individual, father over mother, and the educated over the uneducated, and filial piety above all else. And to be good meant to be obedient. The other interesting thing that happened was that weapons technologies in the Ming had really come a long way. Just like our nuclear bombs of today dwarf those used in 1945, well, gunpowder in the Ming was much better understood, and new and innovative kinds of ways were devised to kill people and destroy objects more efficiently and in a more quantitative way. As much as the Ming forces tried to not let these weapons get into Vietnamese hands, of course they did, and all these cutting-edge technologies of the day that China had come up with now became Vietnam's, too. And this is going to cause trouble for the Ming army soon. Aside from these sinicized elites, most locals in and around the Red River region didn't particularly want the Ming armies and administration in Vietnam. During this quarter-century period of Ming domination, it was a sustained struggle, quashing uprisings and attempts by the locals to demonstrate their popular discontent. The Ming Empire had turned Zhaozhi into quite the cash cow, and this put a lot of economic pressure on the locals. As this popular discontent more and more manifested itself, along came one of the biggest stars ever in Vietnam history. A lot of streets and public places named after this guy. Lei Lai, Li Li in Mandarin. Lei Lai was one of many rebels keeping up the pressure on the Ming military down in Jiaozhi. He came from a landowning family from the town of Lam Sun in Tanhua, a province at the southern part of Jiaozhi. He had started stirring things up as early as 1418 down there, starting the day after Chinese New Year, which in his part of the world was known as Dut. Rebel fighters under his command had been successful in capturing a large cache of advanced Ming weapons, and these would end up being used by Viet forces against the Chinese. Because this all began in the town of Lam Sun, what followed with Lei Lai became known as the Lam Sun Uprising. In order to build up his strength, Lei Lai had been forced to forge a close alliance with two prominent aristocratic families from his region of Tanhua. These two families will play a very high-profile role in the years to follow. These were the Zhen and Nguyen clans. More about them next episode. The climax of Lei Loi's fight for independence to get the Chinese out of Vietnam went down at the Ming fortress of Sung Yang. 
And in two great battles between 1426-1427, he and a whole cast of military and civilian heroes finally drove the Ming forces out of Vietnam. After a six-month siege and ten years of fighting, it was all over. 80,000 Ming soldiers were taken prisoner, and rather than do the usual thing of decapitating everyone, they all got repatriated. But Le Loi held on to their weapons, and Le Loi earned eternal glory in the annals of Vietnam history, credited with ending this especially harsh period of Chinese domination over Vietnam. No more Jiaozhir. Le Loi changed the name back to Dai Viet, and he became its first emperor. And this dynasty was known as the Later Lei, in order to differentiate it from Le Huan's former Lei of 980 to 1009. Remember him? Last episode, he was on duty when the Song Dynasty army first came calling. Unfortunately, Le Loi's reign wasn't as long-lasting as the impact he had on the emerging nation. He died in 1433, five years into his dynasty. Le Loi is also known by his posthumous temple name of Le Tai Do. Again, that Tai Do name, if you recall from last episode in Mandarin, was Tai Tzu. That's the posthumous temple name always reserved for dynasty founders. The later Le had some staying power. They would stick around till 1788, the year before George Washington took office over in the USA. The dynasty ran from 1428 to 1789, with a little Wangmang thing in the middle, which we'll discuss later. This was the longest run of all the Vietnamese imperial dynasties. Le Loi was both a military hero and statesman responsible for initiating all kinds of reforms throughout Dai Viet that enhanced the stability of the emerging state in, in the military, civil service, laws, and in land reform. And because it had always worked so well in the past, a good, old-fashioned, Chinese-style Confucian bureaucratic system was put in place to administer the government, the land, and the people. And the general Chinese-style political framework that Lei Loi put in place, pretty much stayed around in one form or another, all the way till the end of Imperial Vietnamese history. As for Champa, Le Loi patched things up with them and established friendly relations, for now. But with Le Loi gone so early in the game, the dynasty, as dynasties do, fell into a period where contending powers vied for the throne during the 1440s and 50s. Then along came another hero from Vietnam's golden period. This was Le Tan Tong. He had a nice long reign, 1460 to 1497. Le Loi's grandson. That's how he got to be emperor. If no one objects too violently, I'm going to arbitrarily and indiscriminately put the bookmark in here, and we'll pick up next episode with uh, China-Vietnam relations during the reign of Le Tan Tong and the later... Lei Dynasty. And once the later Lei is finished, well, by that time, the South China Sea will be crawling with European adventurers, traders, and missionaries. And that always adds a little spice to the story. Anything could happen when East meets West. And that's sure what happened in Vietnam. As we go from episode to episode, you might be thinking by now that China and Vietnam's history was two millennia of nonstop confrontation. But as bad as it sounds, the truth is, both China and Vietnam got along more than they fought. Nationalists love war and battle. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Scott Seligman's new book is just out on Potomac Press. The Third Degree, The Triple Murder That Shook Washington and Changed American Criminal Justice. Learn all about the story of Mr. Jiang Song Wan. The Third Degree tells the forgotten story of a young Chinese man's abuse by the D.C. police and his arduous seven-year journey through the American legal system that drew in Presidents Warren G. Harding and William Howard Taft, as well as Chief Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes and even J. Edgar Hoover. It culminated in the landmark Supreme Court ruling written by Justice Louis Brandeis that set the stage for Miranda v. Arizona many years later. 
the decision that gave us the Miranda rights that presumes one is innocent until proven guilty and provides protection against coerced confessions. Scott Seligman, ladies and gentlemen, the third degree. I'll have the Amazon link at the usual place on the website that nobody visits. I know. Who needs it? You all got podcast apps. The CHP chat line is now live. If you don't have a Slack account, why not go get one and join me live anytime for some China chit-chat and discussions about anything on your mind. Send me your email address, and I'll send you an invite, and I'll be waiting for you. And if you've no idea what the hell Slack is, I didn't either up until a couple months ago. So if I figured it out, pretty much anyone can. Laszlo Montgomery signing off from the town of Los Angeles, California for the 200th time. If I only had 200 customer comments in the iTunes store. Well, you can't have everything. Listen, sorry I had nothing extraordinary planned for this milestone episode, but I'm going to reserve the right to hold the celebration at a future time of my choosing. Let's try and get through this China-Vietnam series alive first. Take care, everyone, and I hope and pray you'll consider coming back next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.